welcome everyone. Uh, I know it's been a long day for you, so it's only a few hours more to go. Um, today, I'll be talking about data visualization. So first off, let me just share my screen. Um, location window, there you go. Okay, I hope you can see it. Yes, we can. Okay, great. So uh, this, let me just pull this up, okay. So basically, uh, what I'll be covering today is um, an introduction to data journalism and visualization. And then how do you make your own visualization? And then how do you create maps? And I think this will be very useful when you're doing election coverage, because you don't just want to just, you know, if you're a broadcaster, you don't, you don't just want to talk. If you're working in print or online, you don't want to just anyhow just dump it all into text and have a very mundane and boring table. So we'll be touching on these topics. So first off, um, because we don't have much time, so uh, just a brief introduction to what's data journalism. So uh, basically data journalism, we always think of it as, you know, very, very difficult and, you know, concept that we as journalists, we are very repulsed towards the idea of numbers because we think we're only good at words. But, you know, as actually in our lives, everything that we do is related to data, right? Um, as long as it's a string of information, that's data again, uh, that's data already. So, and how, why is data important? Especially, I think after we realized COVID-19, we all have to do with data journalism is that data actually can be a very useful and powerful tool that we can actually tell a story with more depth. So, uh, and provide that sort of context that we need to back up whatever that we're doing or uh, telling or telling the audience in our story. So um, basically how we work with data stories is usually maybe we have, uh, we'll define by actually maybe we have an, a hypothesis or an, a story idea that we think that we require some data to back it up, right? And then we start to look for those data. And once we find the data sets that we need, then, then we'll have to look into how do we clean up the data, right? Um, download, scrape, or, you know, and then we also then also question ourselves um, whether or not the source of data set that we receive, is it from a reliable source? Can we actually trust them? Are they credible enough? And then so now once we clean it up, we you know fix whatever typos and all that, right? Structural issues with the data set. Then we start analyzing the data. Once we analyze the data, we start to figure out whether or not there is a story in the first place, right? Maybe there is no story after all, of which then do not be disheartened. We just move on and then work on another story. But maybe our hypothesis might just be able to be proven when there is actually a story in the data. So then after that, we start to like work on our reporting, you know, we'll start doing our interviews and whatnot. And then we'll then figure out a way to best present this story to our audience. And when it comes to the stage, then you actually think of like, how would you want to present a story? Would you want, you know, like sometimes you, now we work on an online um, atmosphere. So our website is incredibly important. We'll probably think about like, okay, maybe we need to do like multimedia storytelling, you know, with data visualization, with videos, with audios, with text, all of that, photos, all that molded together into one. Now, today we're just going to focus on data visualization, which is, you know, largely talking about Google Sheets, Google Maps, Google Trends and even Flourish. So just as a food for thought, like, you know, every time we think of data visualization, we think, oh, it's so pretty, we should have it in our story. But then you need to ask yourself, why and when do we need data visualization in our story? And what actually makes a good data visualization? Because one of the trappings that a lot of news organizations um, fall into is that, you know, they when they see data visualization, now that there's a lot of interactives and infographics, they want to do it because they think it looks fancy, but it doesn't help to add any value to the story. So you need to ask yourself whether the visualization that you have in mind, does it add any value to the story? Does it strengthen your story? And is it a good visualization? The best way to check is to ask your grandma or basically anyone in your family if they can understand what the visualization within the first three to five seconds means that you have no problem, that visualization is good to go. But if people have trouble understanding it in the first place, then obviously you need to go back to the drawing block and figure out what's the better data visualization or if you even need one at all. So why do you need data visualization in your story? We're not saying all stories need one, but there are times when it actually helps a lot to have data visualization. So it gives an audience a clear idea of what the information means when you give a visual context to it, right? 
So sometimes instead of explaining your data sets in like several paragraphs with a lot of numbers included into your, into your text story, it's actually easier to just present it in a chart, right? And sometimes we also realize that when we are so used to print that, you know, that nowadays static tables doesn't really work um, to tell. It's not, it's not sufficient to tell a story already. We need more interactives. So, and that actually, especially interactives that are relatable to the end reader, that's very important. If they feel that the story relates to them, they'll actually be inclined to click on it and actually play around with the, uh, with the interactive tool. So what makes a good data story, right? So we first find the data, then we understand the data, and then we find whether there is a story within the data, right? But most importantly is that we need to be able to provide insights from the data set. Let me, when we present our story, right? We don't just do what any other reporter do, whereby we just do a news break. Okay, here are the numbers, this is it, and then end of story, especially economic data stories, we tend to do that. Um, so then you actually should look for insights from the data. What does this data tell you? What is the meaning behind it, right? And that's what good journalism is all about, right? So you shift from just reporting the data as is to explain to readers, why is this, data set important? What does this data set tell you? How does this data set affect you as a reader and a layperson? So um, I always like to show this few GIFs because it actually exemplifies uh, what a good visualization should be, which is, you know, basically simple is always the best. And you should be able to find a chart that works for your story and don't get so caught up in producing um, charts that you OD on them for, for your story. So you can see here is an example of how you make a table look very, very simple and neat. And then you highlight the exact point that you want to highlight to your readers in your table so that once they look at the table, within that few seconds, they get it what you're trying to say, right? Instead of staring at it and not knowing. So this is another example um, of a uh, bar chart that you know looks very colorful and fancy in the beginning, but once you remove the extra labelings and then the extra lines, and then reduce the colors, and then you know like just you know you don't need 3D effects, um, and then you know just basically lighten the labels so that you can have um, the juxtaposition of the bacon more prominent. Um, and then so the contrast is there. And then after once you remove the lines, it becomes more obvious that you want to highlight bacon. And this is the other example of a pie chart, right? Uh, people like to do 3D pie charts or they like to do donut charts. I have no idea why, uh, because when you have a, a 3D pie chart, it gets tilted. It looks very strange because um, maybe 14% does not look like 14% anymore. 32 and 42%, you can't differentiate when it's tilted. So then when you flatten it and then you reduce the colors, you make it more obvious, right? But perhaps, do you even really need a pie chart? Maybe a pie chart is not necessary after all, and it can be just turned into a bar chart, and that also tells the same story. So next is we'll look at um, basically Google Sheets. So the reason why we introduce Google Sheets and we use Google Sheets largely is not because I'm from Google. But essentially because uh, everybody would probably have a different version of Microsoft. So I don't know if you're using Microsoft Excel 97 or 2000 or 2010, you know. So basically, if we were to systemize it easier, that's why I'm talking about Google Sheets, because if you open Google Sheets, everyone will be using the same version. So um, on with Google Sheets, the app, you can actually also make charts on the go, but they have limitation uh, because it's obviously on your mobile phone. So there are not as many um, tools available, but you can still do it if you want a simple chart to be done. But otherwise, what we would recommend is to always use the uh, web version of uh, Google Sheets where they actually do even have a tutorial guide on how you can use um, the charts that are available. And I would actually share the links here so let me just post it up into chat so that you can then bookmark it later. So here they have all the lists of um, lines and charts of graphs that are available in Google Sheets and also with the tutorial on how to use them. 
Um, and the other thing that Google Sheets have is that it can actually scrape tables on the web for you. So if it's a HTML page highlight, HTML page, right, then you can actually use the HT, uh, import HTML function. But of course, this does not apply to all tables that you see on the web because not all um, website developers are using HTML um, site, right? So we're using um, Wikipedia as an example because all the tables there we know are HTML. So one example that I will show you here is this. So here's the data that I managed to scrape from this Wikipedia site that is basically called, um, well, it's called the largest uh, list of largest Indian companies. And let me just open that site so that you can see how, how the table looks like on the web page. So here you can see that, okay, this is the table that I'm gonna scrape. Now, um, there is no guideline on this is table number one. It's obviously not listed on Wikipedia page. So you have to pick a guess. Um, the format is like this. You have to put in equals import HTML. And then once you open a bracket, it will give you this guidance, this box will pop up to teach you how to go about this, which is amazing. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you this example. You can see how it pops up. I put equals import HTML and then space, open bracket. Automatically this pops up, right? And so now I know that it's telling me that I need to put an open quotation mark and then I need to paste the link of the page and then close quotation mark, comma, and then space, and then uh, open quotation mark. Again, I put table, close quotation mark, comma, and it's asking me to say which uh, table it is, right? So I'm guessing from the page that I saw earlier, it's probably table number two. And then I put close bracket equals, and then I just hit enter, and then this actually comes up, and this is the same as this, see? Now, um, the reason why I put two, even though this is actually, if you look at it, it should be the first table, right? But why the reason I put two is because um, it's still a machine. So it will identify this box as probably table number one. And hence, this would def probably be table number two. So I pick a guess. I could also try it with table number one, and then you will see that you would get this on your um, Google Sheets instead of this table. Yeah, so, um, so I have also this URL that I will share with you, which offers a guideline on how to use uh, this tool called import HTML. And I'll drop the link here as well. So don't worry, guys, you can just drop your questions and I'll try to respond to them as I go along. Or if not, I'll respond to it at the end of the session. If I'm going too fast, please don't mind me because I have very limited time. Just drop your questions and I'll answer it. Okay, and so, um, and this, yes, I just showed you how to do this. Let's skip this. So one other thing that you can use with Google Sheets is that um, it's not very fancy, it's super basic, is that you can create um, bar charts, tables, um, and like even pie charts, although I do not recommend anyone to use pie charts, always just stick to the easiest one, which is bar chart. So in this example, I just show um, how you can just make a uh, combo chart, which is a line and bar chart together. So for example, I just made, I created my own dummy data. Um, uh, let me just, let's see, where did I put this? Oh, there, there. Okay, so I have this dummy data that I just created. Um, and basically it's, I just created a table, right? And then maybe you have your own data set of this short table that just shows that average monthly household income, monthly household expenses, and an unemployment rate. So I just maybe want to do a story about, you know, how this would affect, you know, um, and basically when it comes to election campaign, you don't just report on the campaign itself. You don't just report on the results, right? You also talk about the issues that affect the people within the area. And usually with any election anywhere in the world, it always comes down to the cost of living, um, employment, you know, economic related bread and butter issues, right? So then that would tie on to whether or not, you know, people want to go out to vote and who would they vote, right? Based on the promises that probably, you know, candidate A, B, C, D, or E would promise them, you know, in terms of, you know, all this bread and butter issues as a benefit, right? So then 
basically, so for example, if you were to have such stories, maybe you need some data and you probably got the data from the local government and then you want to do a table. Um, but you don't have much time. You just need to put it up really quickly. So this is one way to do it on Google Sheets. And you can actually from, I'm just going to just delete this so that you, I can do a fresh one. So just say, for example, I have this. Why is it not deleting? OK, it's very strange. OK, there you go. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to highlight the table here. And then I'm going to click on Insert. And then I'm going to go into Chart. And by default, it would give me this very strange looking. Sometimes it gives me bar chart, sometimes it gives me line chart, but I'm guessing this time it doesn't. It gave me combo chart, so which is great. If it does not, then you just need to just click open and then you just need to select the chart that you want, which is a combo chart. So there you go. So you select the combo chart, but it's not working out fine. It looks very strange. So what I'm going to do is I am going to um, use row one as headers. OK, column A as labels. OK, these are fine. But I'll probably need to then maybe go to customize. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to see what a chart style looks fine. Chart and access title. So I need to then fix the title text first, right? Because right now it's looking very strange. Maybe I'm just going to say why district um, unemployment rate against um, income and expense. Okay, so um, and then so I have this title, and then I could you know adjust um, the font, right? And then I go into series because I want to fix this whole um, this three different categories which does not appear right. So I go and select series, and I click under, uh, wait, hang on, let's see. Oh wait, sorry, series. And then now it says by default, it says apply to all series. No, I don't want to do that. I click open and I know that for unemployment rate, it's percentile. So obviously it would be different from the incomes and expenses, which is going to be like, say for example, rupees, right? So then what you would need to do is you need to select unemployment rate and then it's a line, which is correct. Um, I want it to be a line. I don't want it to be a bar. And then I look at the axis here. Right now it says left axis. No, because left axis, I'm reserving that for the currency, which is rupees. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to select right axis. And now that it shows me that, OK, it's in percentile. So that's fine. OK, so then the line color is yellow, correct. So, But now I have this other problem, which is I have the household expenses as a line instead of a bar. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to look back series. I'm going to select household expenses. And then I'm going to like change type to column. There. And then I'm going to make sure that, OK, it's on the left axis, correct? And then there you go. This is it, right? And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to like just, there's just three little dots. I'm just going to select it, click it. And then I'm going to put their publish chart. And then I click Publish, click OK. And then after that, I click on Embed. And you will get this iframe link. Now, with this iframe link, you can then test it out. And basically, you can upload it onto your website. But before that, you might want to test it out on this website called codepen.io, which is free, by the way. So you do not need to sign up for an account. You just need to click on Start Coding. And then you just need to drop the link that you had, iframe link that you had earlier. OK, so it's not appearing on mine because I'm using a company account, Google account, and so they have restrictions. But it should work on yours. So um, that's how you go about it. I will drop the link for Code Pen here. I think before you publish any visualization, it's always safest to test whether it works or not on Code Pen. If it works on Code Pen, then it should be fine. So yes, and this is just basically I was, I was going to ask you to talk about like you know make sure that you publish your chart otherwise you can't share it and upload it onto your site. So the next thing we're going to talk about is Flourish. So a lot of you may have heard of Flourish, and probably some of you would even have a Flourish account. Um, if your newsroom don't does not have a Flourish Premium Access account, then I would suggest that you go to the website, you scroll all the way down. And there is this thing called like um, newsrooms. And you can actually then request for a free newsroom premium account, 
Now, you can also open your individual account with your Gmail, and that is also fine. The only difference is two things. One is that if you're using a Gmail account, whatever, pub, uh, whatever content that visualization that you publish is public, can be viewed by others. Secondly, is that uh, with a Gmail account, you cannot directly import whatever sheets you have from Google Sheets. You have to basically upload your sheets from, like, say, your um, computer, your drive, uh, or you need to copy and paste your data onto Flourish. So here we're going to look at um, basically this is how. Uh, okay, I'm just also just going to drop the Flourish link here in case you don't have it. And so you can see here, this is how the Flourish page looks like once you open an account and you go in. There are dozens of templates. So in the interest of time, we can't go through all of the templates, but we'll try to cover the most commonly used templates that you see many newsrooms use nowadays. And it's very user friendly and easy to use. And it serves the purpose of your newsroom as well. So the first off is bar chart. So how is this different from the Google Sheets bar chart? Well, um, obviously you can customize the color and there are more options for color. It's not that you can't do it in Google Sheets to set the colors are limited, but there are more color options here and you can even animate it and you can control the animation time. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show the example of how I made one, which is, let's see. I think I did this for fun. Right, yeah, I did this for fun. So I basically got the data sets that I want. And then after that, I because there are not that many, so I can just easily copy and paste it onto Flourish. So the great thing about Flourish is that when you open a new visualization, you select the visualization that you want. In this case, what I'll do is when I sign in, I just need to select new visualization. And then it will show me all these templates, right? And then I just select the like bar chart, right? And then it would basically just show me this templated one. And it would, it's a very good guide for you to know like, okay, this is how it's supposed to be when you click on data tab, and then you see that it will tell you, okay, these are the things that you should have in each column so that you know what to, where to put what. And then they even tell you the labels, right? And the values. Now you just need to follow this guide. So in this instance, I just did one simple one of like on like you know exports of durian from Thailand and Malaysia for fun, uh, just to test it out. And then what I did was once I put the data in, and then automatically this would appear within seconds. And so all I need to do was to just um, adjust the color, right? So I can just go to color. And then I can just, I, you know, select the color palette that I want. And maybe I don't like these color palettes. I think that, you know, it doesn't look great. So I could even like, okay, I could click on edit palette. And maybe what I want to do is I just want to maintain maybe the pink and the uh, green. So I would try to memorize the pink color code. Uh, wait, hang on, let me just, I need to copy the pink code. Okay. And then I just delete everything except for the green. Okay, I'm not sure what's doing there. Okay, but what I'll do is I will try to apply there and then I'll just put there. So if you're not sure how to go about this, there is a question mark here. You just hover over it. The tooltip will show you what is the recommendation. So type the name of the entity. In this case, I want to make it Thailand. And then I put a double dot and then the color code. And then I just need to wait. Usually it appears, but it's just a bit slow. So so usually if you give it like maybe a good two seconds or a minute, or maybe if you refresh it, then it would appear. Okay, um, see this is what happens every time when I try to do demo, suddenly it does not work, but it should. Um, and I would even show you the example of how I even made it, right? So uh, I have other samples as well, whereby I actually managed to make, make it work. 
Ah, this was the one. Um, no, not this one. I did too many demos. Um, anyway, so what you're gonna do, I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna try to find, oh, there. So this is another demo that I did with the bar chart and like, oh yeah, I kind of like played around the color too much for this one. But uh, what I did was, okay. And then after that, I did color palette. Hang on, sorry. I clicked too fast. So what I did was I left it all to, so it's now all gray. And then I, maybe I want to put it as 2009. Hmm. This is strange. Okay, I'm not sure why it's not working. It did the other day. Um, so anyway, so what you can do is you can actually then just play around the colors and then you can even rename your chart um, and you can even have categories on it. Um, and then so what you can see here, it's interactive whereby once you deselect it, then the option disappears. And then remember always to click export and publish. Same thing here with column chart, you can do the same thing uh, whereby you uh, uh, select and play with the color. See, I managed to do this for this one. I don't know why it did not work, but I do a custom override with this. And then you can also annotate um, the chart. So I'm going to show you how to annotate the chart. Okay, I'm just going to open this because this has the annotation done already. Okay, so what I did was there are a few ways to annotate a chart. One is through story mode, one is through the visualization itself. So here's how you do it on the visualization itself. If you go, oh, so it did change the color. It just took a while and I had to reload it. Now it's there, it wasn't there earlier. There you go. So uh, what you're gonna do is that once you go down, you can see that, okay, there are like this, this tab called annotation. You click expand it and then it lets you choose what you want to annotate. So you can actually have a line highlight on x-axis, right? Which is, this is the line highlight. So I put in there 2008 crisis, right? And this is the, basically the annotation that I want. If you cover over a, the question mark again, it will again tell you that how you can actually use this um, annotation. So in this case, this, like, this is the text that I want to put in, 2008 crisis. And then I put there double dot, double dot, and I want to put it on the year 2008. Sorry, let me expand this so you can see. And then I put it there, um, there. So then I put in recovery, double dot, double dot, 2010. And then it also appeared. So, and then there is also this other option and you can select the color. There's also this other option where you can actually select range highlights. So if you do range highlights, then you can do like, maybe this is your text that you want, pump prices drop, double dot, double dot. Then you do the range of the year. So if it's a timeline, 2015 to 2018. Um, so then you again, you can select the color and you can even adjust the opacity. Now, if you don't want it on X axis, you can just deselect this and then change it to Y axis. That show highlights on Y axis. So this is one way to annotate your chart. Another way is if you go click create a story and then you let it load and then you see that there is this pencil here, small little pencil on the right, click on it and then it asks you, it will ask you to select and click on anywhere that you wanna annotate. So say for example, I wanna annotate on this particular year, I just click here and then it will tell me to type my annotation. So maybe I want to add in here, my annotation is, uh, say, um, um, housing market boom. Okay. So, and then I can also adjust if I want a marker or maybe I don't want a marker and I could even adjust how the line looks like, right? I don't want to have a line or I just want to do it like this or even a step or just a normal line. So, and then after that, I can also then click on it right? When it comes up, the, the hand shows up, I can just click on it and then adjust, move it around and adjust how I want it to look like. 
So for example, I want it to be here, there. So I can adjust all of this and I could even adjust the text if I want it to be just lighter instead of bold, I could just the text size, the color of the text. Okay, if I'm happy with it, then I can just leave it and I can just click again, export and publish. Now, once I click publish, right, and I can click on more options, and then I can select iframe and I can get the iframe code now. Now, most newsrooms, um, you know, you can actually use iframe for most newsroom websites. I have not heard of any that doesn't. So if that is, then probably your website is 20 years old and have not been updated. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go back to code pen and I'm gonna paste the code that I had from Flourish earlier. And then you can see the visualization appear. This is how it looks like on your site. So it works just fine. Now, uh, yep, this is still, we talked about this. Um, and then let's see. Uh, next is how do you create a story? Uh, so you can, here's an example, right? Whereby I just create a duplicate because usually when you want to tell a story, you might want to tell a story as a sequence from your data from like, a to B or C and D. So in this case, I had this data bar chart race that was just, uh, that was highlighting all the different regions uh, for their population growth. But that was the first one that I have. This is the template, right? And so what I'm gonna do is I wanted to just have, I made a duplicate of it. And then what I did was I changed to just highlight only the Asian countries. So I changed the color palette and I deleted all the other colors and I just made sure I copied the Asian color, uh, Asian region color. So I made that um, as an exception. So then I deleted all the colors, leaving only gray. And then after that, I put their Asia double dot, the color code, and then I just waited. And then, so the green appeared. So I know that, okay, this is the one that I want. So, uh, what I did was then I just got to like click new slide on my story. And then after that, choose a visualization. And then I chose the visualization that I just did. So then you have a sequence of story whereby you actually tell people, okay, here's what's happening overall. And then let's zoom in onto what's happening in this particular area. So that's one way to use story. Another one that I'm going to show you how to, you can actually use story is that uh, for elections is that you can actually did, uh, do this, I think what I this put him on, hmm. I think it was this, I mean, let me just try to think out, uh, figure out which visualization was it. I think it was this one. If it's not, then no. Um, hang on, hang on, hang on. I think it's this, yeah. So I did a sample visualization a few days ago um, using data from um, the previous election for Bihar because they have both 2015 and 2020. So it's good to then show that, okay, this would probably something that you wanna do, uh, maybe the moment results are announced to just show the before and after. Um, but you can also do one for before if you want to, to just show like, okay, these are the parties contesting and the state elections. And so then, you know, I have this cards, we'll go into this later on, um, this cards. And then after that, I go next is I added in was a uh, state election results, right? And I just, this is a dummy, so it's not actually accurate. I just did this um, just to show. And then I also wanted to show that, okay, here's what the change, here's what changed in 2015 and then 2020. And then when I hover it, I can see the seats that each party has received. And then if you're covering a wider region and probably you want to show like each different like, you know, main states, you can also do that. In this case, I just took states. So I was just thinking like, okay, just I took Bihar and then I took Delhi. So if you can see what's happening in Delhi with this parties, then I go to Bihar and I can also see. And it also then shows you the uh, percentage uh, change from the previous election. So I'll also show you how to do this. But basically, this is a general idea of what you can do with um, story. So when you go to like, as I mentioned just now, you can like, you know, just go to your visualization. Once you do this, you can just hit on click create a story. 
And then you can just keep on adding a new story, choose a visualization, and then just keep adding a new story. You can add until like however many that you want. Um, ideally, we don't suggest having that many. So these are just examples. Right, let's move on. Um, hang on. Okay, so the other thing that we wanted to um, introduce is host risk chart because uh, we find that a lot of readers and newsrooms, they tend to have this tendency and liking for host risk chart. So I guess it's very useful to just show change over time, especially if you have data on um, the election results as it comes in, then you can even input in time. So maybe they were announcing it at 12 a.m., then 2 a.m., then 4 a.m. So you can then have this sort of host trace chart going as you know as each election result is announced for every single seat. Now for this example, I actually used data from Google Trends. Uh, so what I did was I just searched up uh, trends um, for data for a data set. And you can actually just do it very easily, right? So you just go to trends page and say, for example, you're looking for a particular political candidate, or if not, to make it easier, I just want to look for a political party. Um, and then I want to compare that with the, say, Congress. Um, so the BJP and the Congress. So I just want to maybe like, do a comparison. So with trends, you can do a comparison up to like, I think five. So, uh, and then any more than that, it's not possible. So, and then I changed the country because it's default always the US. So I need to change it to India. And then maybe I just want to know what's been going on in the last 90 days because, you know, elections heating up. Okay, maybe there's a lot of chat. So maybe people are just looking up, right? And if you look at this, um, if you scroll down, you can actually see people are already looking up, you know, the candidate lists. Uh, for West Bengal and in general, and then the Congress candidate list, they're doing the same thing, right? And so what I'm gonna do is I can actually download the data from this whole search interest for BJP and INC, the Congress here. I click on this button and automatically I'll have a CSV file downloaded. Once that file is downloaded, I can then basically put it into my sheets. Uh, I'm going to show you the example that I have, which is, uh, let me see, let me see, where is it? Where is it? Um, okay, hang on. I'm just looking for the chart. Mm, there, transpose trace. So when I have the data downloaded, it actually looks like this. It appears in this format from trends, which is basically, it's a, well, vertical table, right? But if you remember when we open up Flourish and we go to new visualization, and then we go to scroll down all the way to, where's the host race chart? Uh, there. So um, I select this. And then you can see in the preview data set that they have an ex as an example that the table for the timeline, it's listed as horizontally. So it's not vertical, unlike what I got here, which I think most likely when you get any data sets, it will look like this. So how do I make it um, vertical? I mean, from vertical to horizontal. I can actually use this function called transpose. So I just select here equals transpose, there you go. And then I just need to put in uh, which column. So A1 and then double dot until let's see what's the last. The last one is basically C91, right? And so then I just put in here C91, close bracket equals there you go. So I got the data set here already. So I just need to copy this long table onto my um, data here. And then after that, I would just need to wait and automatically my um, host trace chart will appear. And I will show it to you that this is how it looks like. Uh, this was a sample that I did with a COVID-19 vaccine, right? So then you can see that this is how it looks like. And so with some people actually ask, how do you get the you know, images here? 
So if you go to data, you remember that there is this label called image column, and it's usually column B. And so I just look for um, open data uh, for images. So usually Wikimedia or data commons, you know, Wiki commons would have like free images that you can use. So I just look up the free images and I just drop the link there. Uh, sorry. So then um, I can also then adjust like uh, the speed. If you go to animation, you can select see here animation duration. If I want it to be slower, I can just put 300 and then I just hit replay and you can see it's much slower now. I could also adjust uh, these uh, the dates to whether they want to like slant or not. So like if just say the x axis. So um, there you go. See the text angle is ninety degrees now. So I can just change it to like thirty degrees. So it will look like this. So you can just play around a bit. And remember, uh, there's also a footer option. Uh, there's a header and footer option. Header is for you to put the title in. Footer is for you to actually put the source attribution. In this case, I put the source name. I can even insert the source URL. So if you're taking data from the Election Commission website, you can actually attribute back to the Election Commission and put in the link. Okay, so this is an example of a bar chart race that has a little mini graph at the bottom. Now, how do you do this? Very quickly, I would just show you one example of that. Okay, every time I have to look, I cannot look for it. It's just very, very strange. It's a bar chart race. Okay, is this a bar chart race? Yes. So with the bar chart race, when you select your template, you select bar chart race, and you can actually see here. Let me just look for the visualization new visualization, then you just scroll down. It's not here, you have to go down. Um, and it will see that there is the line chart race, which was the horse chart race we were talking about. And then there is also a bar chart race. So you can actually select the bar chart race. Yeah. So, um, and then you can, let me see. Uh, yeah. So, uh, you can then after that just uh, uh, select the bar chart race, sorry. Um, and, and then after that, how you want to make this graph appear is that there is this little thing called like, I think it's under time counter and totalizer, but let me just check um, there. It's under timeline and animation. So if you go to like timeline and animation for bar chart race, you can actually see that, okay, they have timeline style enabled, okay? And then after that, there is this graph. If I select, now it says show. If I select hide, it disappears. If I select show, it appears. And that's how you get the little graph at the bottom. And you can even select if you want curved lines. And then you can also adjust the timeline duration for your animation. So that's that. And the other bar line or column flows charts that you can use is um, line chart searchable and grid of line column chart. So for parliament charts, we find it very handy because um, you know it's useful to then you be able to have a 25th, the last election and the current election data sets compared, right? And they even automatically calculate the percentage change for you. Now, the way to do it, it's just super easy. So this is what you need to do. You just need to like drop your data sets into uh, the parliament seat chart template. And you just need to basically calculate on um, which party, how many seats they got the previous election and how many seats they got in the current election. Of course, if you haven't got the results yet, you would just create this as a template and leave this blank. The moment results are announced, you can just fill it in and then you can immediately publish this. So it would automatically calculate for you as well. Um, it will automatically calculate for you as well the uh, the basically the um, the uh, there is the results at the bottom. It can cal calculate for you the percentage change between the last and current elections. Just let me look for um, the. I'm just trying to look for the table. Yes. Right now on the table, it's hidden, right? If I select show table and it will show you these are the parties. Okay, how many how many percentage uh, seat change that they have? Sorry, seat change that they have, number of seat change they have in the last and the current election. 
So you can see gains and losses here. You can also hide this if you don't want to show it, and that's also fine. Yeah, so this is how it's going to look like. As always, just click export and publish and just hit republish if you made any changes, and then you can just test it on CodePen if it works. The other one is election results chart. Now, this is a little trickier because um, it requires you to key in data. So the cool part is that you can have different different seats yeah, if you want to like you know show all the different seats. Uh, of course, if you have 200 seats like in Bihar, 243 seats, I'm not sure if you can do it, but you can try. That's a lot of seats. I would like to suggest that you know maybe you want to highlight the main particular seats, the hot seats. Then you can do this to just show and explain your story of what has changed in the last and current election. So then you see that okay, um, maybe not all parties contest in every single seat. This was the case that I realized when I tried to key in the data that you know that some parties that contested in Bihar did not contest in Delhi, right? Obviously. So what do I do? I cannot leave it blank. I need to put it in zero. Otherwise, my visualization would not appear. So once I hit put in zero, then I actually managed to get this chart to appear. Yeah, and then as usual, um, you can always adjust the color palette and you can adjust the header and the footer to have your attribution and your um, title for your animation. So cards, right, um, what we're using, cards can be great as a brief description of, let's say, political parties, you know, especially those that are contesting the election. Maybe there's so many people don't know all of the parties. Maybe it's good to just have a card to just introduce people. These are the parties that are contesting. And, and also sometimes we, we, people use it for sports teams or sports players or places of feature or sports that are uh, places that you want to promote, such as tourism sites or local flea markets, historical places. So you can also use it to you know, highlight these are the main political candidates contesting in this election, and here's why you need to take note, right? So then you can use cards as well. So um, carousel also, this carousel function on cards also lets you filter out um, by categories. And then there's also grid with filters. Grid filters, the only difference is that it allows you to have a bit more text as compared to the carousel. Sorry, I'm talking about profiles not great filters, profiles version provides you with more text. So one sample that, and I put this together in 20 minutes, it's not the prettiest, as you can see the colors are pretty dull, so I can actually play around a bit more, but I put this together in 20 minutes by just compiling the parties that are contesting. And like, I was figuring like, thinking like, who do I wanna, what, else, what other data do I wanna put in, right? What are the information? So I just figured, okay, maybe I wanna put in, um, not just the party name, but the party leader, and uh, which coalition they're under and how many seats they're contesting in the current election. And so, uh, this, wait, no, not this. Um, this is the sample that I did, right? And this is how it looks like on the backend data. So when you go into data, they would have a guideline already. So I just sort of figured that I need to find the free logos uh, available uh, of these political parties. And then I listed down the party. And then after that, I know that it says the title is always a uh, column A, image is column B, categories. So I want to divide them to coalition as categories. So I listed down a coalition. And then D is the subtitle, which is I put in the party leader. And then I also put in um, what text that I want to put in, which is uh, I can put in two columns, in this case, C and E. And of course, then I just need to like, you know, um, adjust if I want to like have uh, the cards um, layout portrait or maybe landscape or maybe image overlay. So I select a portrait and then I also can adjust the card structure, image above text, title above image, image below text. I don't like all of that. I prefer this. So then you can also adjust the width and whatnot. And then again, you can adjust the colors and then you can play with text. Remember the header and the footer as well. And you can see here, if I deselect it, I would basically eliminate this. I just want to view this too. And if I want to add this back, I can always do that. And then you can also then scroll and adjust. Okay, so that's that. And next one is flourish table. So 
Table is the fancier version of Google Sheets. Just now you, you talked about, you know, I'm doing putting up a table um, or a bar chart on Google Sheets. Well, now Flourish, they also have Flourish Table. Why is it better than your normal table that you do for print, especially? Because it allows you to search within the table. So it pulls out um, only the data, letting you pull out only the data that you want to look at. So it's great if your data has a, the table has a lot of data, say hundreds of rows, and it also looks better than Google Sheets, of course, or like you know any standard static table is always boring, right? So five situations that you can apply to use a table is when you want to like say show individual precise values by having the search function. You can compare data sets, right? When you have many different um, ways to rank particular data. And then you can also show detail and summary of the data and when there are different parameters of measurement. In this case, when you want to show like a ratio or like a mini uh, or like a mini line graph here. And when you have a lot of categorical data, which in this case we categorize, uh, we have different countries as categorical data. So for more tutorials by Flourish, please check out these pages. I will stick the link here as well. So um, what's great about Flourish is that their YouTube page, they are constantly releasing tutorials, uh, which I think is very, very helpful for journalists. Uh, so if you want to learn more about Flourish, you can just go watch the tutorials on the YouTube page. And they also post up um, updates on like their templates on their blog. And if they make any changes to the existing templates, then they would also post it here on this link called What's New. And then we shall move on to mapping. So the next thing that we want to talk about, forgive me if I'm going too fast, I only have 10 minutes left, is that right? you can use Google Sheets to map, to actually create a map. But the downside to Google Sheets is that you can only create um, the geo charts for uh, global data. So meaning if it's a country-based data because it doesn't narrow down by address or location. So what you can do with Google Sheets then? This is what I was talking about. You can only do data like uh, visualization like this with Google Sheets. So what I'm gonna use with Google for, uh, what I'm gonna use Google Sheets for is to use it for my maps. So my maps is a very easy to use tool and it doesn't require any genius to know how to use my maps. Basically, my maps pull in data from Google Maps, and you can actually just easily use it um, to create your own mapping, uh, your own polygon, your own route or line map. So I'm going to show you how to do this. But first, we're going to talk about how sheets, data from your Google Sheets, can be plucked onto my maps. Now, if just say you have a whole data set of addresses or coordinates. Coordinates will be better if you have the longitude, um, latitude coordinates that will make it your location even more precise because most of the time, sometimes if your address is not precise, you only go down to street name, but the street is really long, then it's very hard to be able to tell which location particular on the street you're actually referring to. So if you have a lot of unit number, that's better. But if, you, if it's possible, try to use coordinates. Now, what we're gonna do is that we're gonna have this coordinate file on Google Sheets. In this case, I got this dummy data from um, online on GitHub, and I actually managed to just get, okay, it was basically a real estate data. So with like, you know, condominium names, with latitude, longitude, and also the address. And then second is I open my maps. And then once I open my maps, then after that, third is I import my Google Sheets file onto my maps. And then I can then wait for it to load, and then I can personalize. Now I'm gonna show the example how it's done. I'm gonna, this is my maps, and I'm gonna tell you that the link to my maps is actually, let me just copy and paste the link to my maps first. Okay, this is the link to my maps. I've already shared it in chat. So what you're gonna see on my maps is that once you open, you also be empty if you've not done anything before. Then you just hit create a new map, and then you go into, this page, so it's empty, right? So then I could name it. Maybe I just want to do like, okay. And then I can even add a description. And then I hit save. And then there is this import button, remember? So just hit on it. And then it would ask me if I want to upload a file or just pick something from a Google Drive, which I already have. 
So uh, there, I select it and then it will load. And then it will ask me immediately because it identified that I have latitude and longitude data sets in my file. So which is great, it will automatically recommend this too, right? If there isn't, then it will, you have to select address. So I hit continue. And then you tell me which, you ask me which column that I'm gonna use as a title. And then in this case, I want a condo name and then hit finish. And then I just let it load. And there you go, here's my data set. And then I can play around with this by adjusting um, the uh, markers. So what I'm gonna do is you can see here, the markers here, it says all items, right? I can just hit the little bucket. I could select the color. I could even change the icon. And then I hit okay, and there you go. And if I hover over each, um, over each uh, data, you can see that it's all different, right? Because each data set is different. So each is a different unit condo, then the address is not the same. So I realized the problem uh, with uploading this is if your data set is not accurate, then you will have a lot of icons stick together. So it looks as though it's one instead of many. Um, and the reason for this is because like I say, if your data set, say for example, does not show you the precise location, but along a street. So for example, they say it's on Birch Road. And on Birch Road, you have three different locations that you want to mark on Birch Road, but you did not identify the exact spot on Birch Road. So what it's going to do um, on my maps is that it's going to automatically by default, anyhow select a spot on Birch Road for you and have all three markers on, on top of each other. So it's always better to get a very precise coordinate. Okay, and of course, then you can also, um, you know, basically publish and then share and embed your map on to your website. So this is what I was talking about. Um, yeah, and so what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna show you how to publish it. So basically, first of all, you need to um, hit this, hit share, sorry, hit share. And um, I'll be like, okay, done. Okay, and then you just gotta make it public. And then after that, hit this three little dots and then hit embed on my site. And then you get this iframe link, which you can then copy. I'm not sure if it's gonna work on CodePen because I'm using my company account. Let's just give this a try. Ah, oh, there you go. So this is how it will look like on your website, right? And if you want your, um, your width to be more responsive, you can actually try adjusting now 640. I could try to change it 100%. Okay, it doesn't really work. Uh, I think it was actually. Um, no, so we should just stick with the original. So basically, okay, it's, this is how it's gonna work on your, um, look like on your site. And you can actually just, you can see that you can actually even click on it. And so what I'm gonna do next is I'm gonna show you how to create your own map, right? Um, again, if you just say you have, uh, you do not have any like, you know, sheets to import. So you click on create a new map. And then you go to uh, look for the location that you want to start. So for example, you want to do a campaign trail for this particular politician. So maybe you want to go to somewhere. Let's see where is there that we can just start zooming into. Maybe you want to start somewhere near the botanical gardens. Okay, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start something here, okay. Let's just say that politician A is gonna do a campaign trail in this particular area. And so he's gonna start his campaign trail maybe from somewhere near the gardens, okay? So then if you open it again, remember to name your map, um, okay, campaign trail. And then you can add the description, save it. And then now we're gonna have, okay, we don't want this marker, so we should. Let's just delete this. Uh, never mind, I'll just work on it later. So um, then you can see if you 
hover over all these little tabs on top, there is this thing called draw a line. Click, click on it. And then you can start drawing your line. Maybe he started from here. Then, you know, you can just like keep going. Okay, here's, you wanna stop here. And just double click and just stop. Maybe you don't wanna add a description for this one. You wanna have a marker instead. So you can add the marker here and just put your um, option A begins this campaign trail for producery. Okay, and you can add a description um, um, in order to shore up support in this uh, um, in this opponent's area. He did this, okay? So then you just hit, you can even add a photo. So say for example, your photographer went to the ground, took some nice photos, you can actually upload it here. Um, I don't have any photo right now, so I am just gonna look it up on Google. Okay, so perhaps I could just add this. Okay, so you can, I, the reason why I'm doing this right now is because I wanted to show you that you can add more than one photo. So now it says one of one. I can see that I can delete this on bin or I can also hit add the plus sign and I can add another photo. So this is just to show you that you can add several photos onto one marker. Okay, and then I also just let it load. Then once it's done, so you can see now there are two photos and then I hit save and then I can even change the marker like I mentioned. I don't like this marker. I want to change it to maybe a different color or a different icon. Okay, there you go. And then say for, okay, so now he's walked into here. So what I'm going to do is I want to like continue on. I want to add another marker because this is where he started, but this is where he made a stop and stops at a, sorry, stops um, at a restaurant. So, okay, maybe you can put this here, um, you know, A spoke to the Taxi Driver Association um, at the restaurant to blah, 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 blah. And then you, and again, you can add a photo and then you can hit save. Again, you can also change the marker. And then from there, I can even like then just keep adding on, add a line and just keep doing this, right? Until like, you know, I'm done with his campaign trail. Say for example, maybe this is the end point, um, last pit stop, right? Um, protests at the uh, residential area bar position A from entering the suburban neighborhood. Okay, then save. Okay, then I'm done. So once I'm happy with this, then I just need to remember to hit share. And then I just need to like, okay, once it's shared, then I just need to go into embed on my site and get the iframe. And then I can just test it on CodePen and then I can, if it works, then I can up upload it onto my site. Now, this is one thing that we can do with line, like a route, right? But what if there is an area that you want to highlight? With this, we're going to talk about drawing a polygon. Again, you go to hit draw a line, add a line of shape, and say, for example, you want to do this. This is the particular area that the, so you just need to make sure that the lines all connect. So I connect this, the moment I connect this, it becomes a polygon. So then I'm gonna put this here, protest area. And I add the description. And then I add a photo and then I hit save and then I can change the polygon color. Say for example, I want it to be something um, light there. And then I can even adjust the transparency and the border width. So once I'm done, okay, then again, I can then, you know, make sure I re, uh, republish this. Um, and then after that, you know, it should be fine. So what I'm going to, what, what I want to tell you guys is that if you're working for TV, 
you can also still use this and then you can embed it onto your um, your uh, Google Earth Studio. What you're gonna do is that you just need to hit these three little dots and then hit on, click on export to KML, KMZ. And then from there, you can then uh, download a, the KM, KML file, which you can then use on your Google Earth Studio. Now, when you start your new project, say on Earth Studio, right, for example, uh, this was a demo that I did, a uh, sample that I did, then you open um, Earth Studio, then once you open a new project, there is this uh, tab called overlay, hit on overlay, then select import KML, upload from computer, and then just upload the file that you had downloaded from my maps. And then automatically it would load up like this, basically, which is in the um, uh, satellite image format, but you see the polygon that you created is still there. And then all you have to do with, of course, a studio is a totally different lesson altogether, but basically you can actually just do your uh, minor edits, you know, toggling, tilting, panning, your angles on a studio, and then you can later on export it out to use on your, say, whatever video editing software that you're using for broadcast, Premiere, or Adobe Premiere, whatever. So you can do all of that here and then uh, export it later on. So this I already covered. So the other thing is maps on Flourish. So um, Flourish also has templates for uh, maps. And um, what you can use uh, with regards to India is that you're very fortunate. You have the assembly um, seats and the parliamentary seats map and also the states map. So um, the states map is updated until like I think 2019. So barring any changes, it should still be usable unless there is the government did some borderline change that you know that has not been announced. I'm, I have no idea. So the other thing is that we know that the parliamentary and assembly um, seats have been updated as of October last year, thank you to data leads. So basically these maps are usable. So you can use it um, and be, play around with it and just have your assembly uh, map I think which applies for your state election, you can use this as well, but it requires a bit more knowledge of how to play around with your JSON file. The other alternative is if you use a blank and you upload your JSON file onto it, and then you can actually play around with that. Um, so this was an example of a um, Flourish story that I found uh, that someone did, I have no idea who this person is, but I thought it was a very good use of Flourish that he created a story of just basically using the maps template. And then he also did this with the table, um, Flourish table template. Uh, and then after that, he also used the parliament um, seat map template. And then he did the same to compare 2015 results again. So, uh, yeah, so basically how you use um, the Flourish Maps template is that, you know, you would need to then, once you upload your GeoJSON file, you need, to base, uh, you need to select of the data and merge with whatever your results is. I managed to do this with the Singapore Parliamentary um, election, General Elections for last year. So I uploaded the GeoJSON file for the Singapore Electoral Boundary Map. And then after that, I have a CSV file that only lists out the candidates and the parties that won and for which constituency. And I went and select on upload data and merge, and I merged that CSV file into the data set, the GeoJSON file that I already have in this um, map that I uploaded earlier. So another thing that you can always do is the emoji marker map. So with the emoji marker map, let's, um, so with the emoji marker map, uh, what you can actually do is that you need you can upload photos. Hmm. That's my emoji marker. This is my oh, there. So I'm gonna show you just very quickly how this um, emoji marker marker map works. That you know you can add, basically play around with your map style. You can select the map style that you want, and then after that you can also then um, customize your markers. And your markers, right? Okay, again, here's the latitude, longitude, all that. The markers, you just need to insert the emojis. So you can copy and paste the emoji from somewhere on the internet and just uh, have it here. And then it would appear as markers, which is pretty cute. Um, and then you have this one, which is the photo marker map. Again, 
Here is it's the same as the emoji marker map. The category instead of putting emojis, you just uh put in like your free uh photo that you found on the internet that are for free to use, and then you or you if you uh that you can just put it here, drop the links here, and then so they can pull the photo up, and then it would appear like this. And so have fun creating your own charts, cards, tables, and maps. And remember, don't OD on the graphics. I this is one example I found of a news um, of a news site in the US. It only has charts and it has like I think more than 10 charts. So just remember not to OD on graphics. So as always, we have all our training materials on the site called g.co slash news training. Every training module is no long, no longer than 10 minutes. So it's pretty short. You can do it at your own pace. And if you have questions about our tool or you have questions about today, you can always feel free to ask me. Um, and if you have any questions, I'll take them right now. All right. Uh, thanks, Trina. Thank you so much. It was a very informative session. Um, just a couple of questions. Um, the first one is, uh, does the free version of Flourish also give as many features or do we need to go in for a paid version? I will always advocate for free stuff. So um, I would say that the free account lets you do everything you need to do. Like I said, there's only two things that you cannot do with a free account. Which, which is you cannot directly import um, Google Sheets uh, file onto Flourish, but the paid account can. So if you have your data copied in Flourish, uh, on, sorry, on Google Sheets, you cannot directly uh, have that upload button uh, on the Flourish. There's an upload button whenever you want to upload your data. You can't just upload this, uh, your um, Google Sheets file, but that's fine. You can always copy and paste from Google Sheets onto Flourish. Uh, and the other thing is that uh, you, your as a free account, whatever that you publish, visualization that you publish, is actually available for public viewing. So it means other people can actually see what you have published. Now, if you're working for a newsroom, the newsroom can request for free access to a premium account. So it's something that we're trying to support newsrooms that we are offering a free flourish premium accounts only for newsrooms. And so it's up to the newsroom editor to then share that account use among people inside the newsroom. That account is supposed to be available for more than one user within that newsroom itself. So I hope this clarifies. But unfortunately, if you're a freelancer, there's nothing that can be done. You will just have to use the free account and you open it with your Gmail. All right, uh, thank you so much. The next question is, uh, is CodePen only for testing uh, uh, as to how it will look um, on the website? Yes, it's just for you to test because you don't want to run into trouble where you did not test if your visualizers, visualization work and you just upload it onto your site only to have readers then you know, scroll through on a mobile tablet and they see that a blank, there is a blank screen, you know, it's not loading properly or it's showing arrow 404. So, um, putting on code pen just basically it's this extra step, a very simple extra step so that you know that it works and then you can upload it onto your site. All right, thank you so much. Um, we have one more question coming in, which is, uh, can we get the flourish data in a final JPG or PNG form? Something we can directly use to put on a website or print. Yes, you can. So sorry, I did not show this to you. So when I'm gonna like just, uh, if you look back here, uh, I would just use this. Okay, so it says here export and publish, right? And so there, do you see this download HTML and download image? So if you hit download image, you will get the static one. So if you're doing a bar chart or column chart or a line chart, then you can, or a table, you can just hit on download image. Then you would have the file saved onto your computer. 